start with this one. Right. Um, so if you have your book, some it is directed to that. If you don't have, you could look at the slides. So um, the last thing we did, the very last thing was organizational learning. So if you have the book, that's on page 12. So organizational learning, just right, just right there, just right there in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the last thing we did, right? Well, I don't know if you remember these charts. We sort of did that and we kind of covered, you know, like um, like even a question was the main reason for sharing lessons learned, right? So the very next thing is the purpose of benchmarking. Um, so let me read a bit. Uh, these are very easy concepts. Um, to me, the explanation is in the thing itself, right? Benchmarking, right? But let's read a bit and um, see if we could just understand this one a bit, right? So benchmarking is a way of discovering what is the best performance being achieved in the process safety industry? Let me just check the um, participants list here a bit, right? And again, well, welcome to all of you, right? I mean, you all are so varied. Um, we have folks here from Tobago and, of course, folks from Trinidad and folks from Guyana in this batch anyway. But not everybody is here, right? Uh, benchmarking compares one's business process safety management and performance matrices to the industry best and best practices for other companies. Information can then be used to identify gaps, and I guess in your organization or your organization processes in order to achieve a competitive advantage. I don't think it will get any better than that. Like in terms of an explanation, right? Everything is, I mean, they basically tell you what everything is there that um, a company then could actually benchmark against like what the industry norm is for process safety and then see if they are coming up to that standard, right? So the, everything else on my slide, I think is actually examples of that, right? I can give you some examples and that does the explanation because it's not as if they're gonna give you what is benchmarking, right? So they use some benchmarking to evaluate various aspects of your own you know, performance against, I guess, a better standard to identify why the performance is as it is to drive applicable areas and process safety for improvement, to determine the best practice, practice and asset integrity management and time scale for maintenance of such. I mean, that's just one example that does not really, you know, like what benchmarking is, that's just an example of how it applies to process safety. So for example, if then, you know, like um, companies in the field, and right, let's say they are doing three maintenance plan preventative maintenance for the year, which we call shutdown, right? But uh, that's the industry norm then, right? So even if you are not part of the industrial estate, but you have, you know, like business with the industrial estate and you have equipment and stuff, what that could be taken to be is that even if you're not that industrialized, but you yourself could do like three inspections, right? Of your equipment to sort of keep up to that standard, right? A very good example, Exactly, this course, right? So this course has become like the process safety standard uh, since Nibosh came out with it. Um, you know, so I remember we tell you this, it's not just you all, you all represent different companies and stuff here, but we do, we have done Atlantic LNG. We, we are doing currently the Salcott, right? I have done, if I call the companies, I might know all of them, certain catalyst companies, uh, well, servicing over the years, um, MP, uh, Digicel, right? So, um, you know, uh, Paria, when the, when, like, when Petrogen first, you know, started to, you know, rebrand and hire, we were seeing process safety knowledge, we were seeing process safety management. And, like, the strange thing is, right, remember, um, I've told this story before, that, like, we were the one then to bring process safety to Trinidad, this particular course, right? But I never had any agreement with anybody. I never went to any company. I never, this is when the same thing I'm talking about, right? I never, you know, say that I went to a company and say, look, we have process. We, we never did that. We always operate like a school, right? Other than, um, well, I do consultancy, but that's for stores. So it's not as if it's anything process safety. But to see vacancies, uh, say in process safety management, is sort of, to me, it is strange. Why is it strange? Because if we didn't have this course then, right? So like where the knowledge was coming from, where the process safety management knowledge was coming from, right? Because we never had any 
talks, discussions, none with anybody, right? So, so then where did they get the idea to put, to put process safety management on their vacancies then, right? And then even if they did, let's say somebody researched, you know, which is what best practice is, but then who was going to be qualified? Because before 2017, process safety, like process safety management was not in Trinidad, right? So that's how interesting that is. And as I say, the, the training then, like this course has become like a benchmark, right? For like for the industry in terms of training. So that uh, I guess companies are seeing what the other companies are doing. And we have done this through the Caribbean, including Guyana. Of course, Nikisha is proof of that here, but we have actually done stranger countries, right? I mean, Guyana is, is huge, but we have done, I've done Montserrat, which was, which to me was very strange, right? Montserrat people were doing a company that was doing process safety, right? St. Kitts, uh, St. Lucia, Grenada, of course. So, uh, and this is, like I said, there is no other provider in the region. So who was going to fill that gap, right? So it's just a strange thing, you know, that, um, that, that none of we, again, like those Montserrat connections, I never knew nobody there. People just contacted us. Right. And still, I, I don't, there's no ads, there's nothing going on to those places, but that's just how I guess the industry standard is anyway. So if it's neighbor worship, it's process safety, I guess that's how it is anyway, right? So the use of benchmarking to determine areas of improvement, such as the use of management of change, but that's another example. I just use training as an example, uh, to determine and foster an environment of continued improvement with respect to process safety culture. So all of these are examples of things you could benchmark against then, right? Training, process safety, culture, compliance with standards, risk identification, and risk analysis. Like, what is the companies doing? But I could tell you, they're doing hazards, right? So hazards, hazards, something called an ETE. That's what the process industry is doing. So then that's why you have other companies wanting to do it too. Asset integrity and reliability. That's just managing all your assets, but is managing it in a way where you have maintenance, then you have shutdowns, you have regular maintenance. Management of change, by the way, is a form. So if something has to be changed, like a chemical, a valve, a pipe, even an employee, like a manager, then like a, a safety, a process person, there's a form to fill out and then that has become like the standard now anyway, right? So measures and uh, matrix using assessed process safety risk. And again, that could speak to ETAs, especially when they mention metrics, because metrics, you know, the ETA chart, which, which you all have not, but not, but not too much idea of, is really a mathematical chart. It's really a chart with some maths involved in it, right? Now, I don't think that has become the industry standard in Trinidad. I have never pushed it, right? I mean, I've, I've well, I've seen has ups, but so when I say push, I mean, it's like if I do anything, but when you look at the vacancies, you see, they mentioned has ups, so then we kind of stress on the has ups. But there is another chart called an ETA chart, and that chart is a bit of a calculation. Not too hard if you have a scientific calculator. No, you would not get to do it. It's really fun maths, but really, the, when I say fun maths, I mean, fun maths is, is a minus, like, I mean, you have a calculator, right? So, like, things just a minus and add and whatever have you, right? So, it's not. Fun math is not like trigonometry we're doing it. It's not trigs, it's not, it's not sine, cosine, and tan. It's just normal maths. But there are, but there are formulas than ETA. Um, however, uh, like what I could do when I reach that, I would probably reach that next week. When I do that, when I reach it, I can probably show you some of the minus and like you'll see how nice it is. But anybody who wants to do like an ETA course, I guess you could probably contact us separately because this process safety that it, it do have that level of maths in it, right? They just show you what the ETA chart is. And um, so, you know, it's not as if you're getting a calculation, you are not getting a calculation for your assessment. However, you have to know the purpose of the ETA chart, right? But there is the level six program, the NIBOSH diploma, right? There is the level six program that, um, you know, have students do an ETA and they, they get a lot of marks, right? And, a lot of them who like maths, right? And, and maths, is, maths is good because maths is consistent. That's the one thing with maths, right? Like if you write a passage, there's no way to tell if what you write there is correct. But if you have a sum to work out, S-U-M, if you have a sum to work out and you know the formula, well, maths is consistent, right? So a lot of 
diploma students love the maths because, like I said, it's not trigonometry. It's just adding and minusing and multiplying, right? And you have a calculator. So the maths is show them. Like if you're supposed to get 0.5 and they get 0.5, that means they get full maths, right? So at the degree level, they do love the ETAs. At this level, you would not get to do any calculation. I'll probably show you part of one just to show you how, how easy it is. But that's what they mean then, like, you know, um, you know, if, if in a company an ETA chart is a standard, but well, then you can benchmark against that. It really is not. From judging the vacancies, I haven't really seen too much ETAs. I've more seen hazards, and hazards are not mathematical. Hazards is like a chart that you construct, right? Any questions on this? I think I'm done. I'm not going to read out all because the concept was, see if you understand, the concept was that a company would look at the industry standards to see what is the requirement for process safety and if it is you know three uh shutdowns for the year if it is process safety knowledge via this course if it is you know your company doing a hazard or you have a high safety culture but you just meant you could benchmark against that and if you benchmark against that you can sort of see if your company is meeting that and if you're meeting that but then you're meeting the the the, the industry norm right february month right if you feel as a joke i don't I was not going to say I do have it here, but I have it here. I'm not going to show it. Huh? I'm sure I'm a business, right? But fe like February month, I have trading for the Salpa Tamati there tomorrow. They are doing a Nibosh, another Nibosh course tomorrow. But February month, they have booked in process safety. And that's not the first batch. I mean, that's like, you know, early before the pandemic, they had done some. But this is the first batch out of, you know, the pandemic anyway, right? They have booked in process safety. A lot of companies, like I said, not like even in the region, Guyana, right? Guyana, Showbase have booked in, you know, certain courses. So, um, Nibosh Risk Assessment. Remember, there's a lot of other courses on there. But if we're talking about process safety next month, which is next week, right? I have uh, a book in there, you know, for the process safety management course, right? So, the, so do you all understand it? So, it's real and it's real that it's not like we're talking, you know, benchmarking and companies not benchmarking. Companies are benchmarking, right? Case in point, what I just showed you there on the envelope, right? So you can read out the rest. I don't think there's any more concepts. All of these are things you could benchmark against, right? Contractor management. I, again, it's not that kind of exam where they say what, what are 10 process safety benchmark. It's not that, right? This is not the degree. This is level four. So like they'll give you four answers and they may say like... um. In fact, I don't think they'll give you a full permit. They, but it was like, what's the purpose of benchmarking? Like, like, what is the most important purpose of benchmarking? And the answer may be something like, you know, like um, seeing what the industry best practices are to improve your own company performance. Something like that. You're just going to meet that up on the spot. But as a benchmarking is all about, right? You can get them from here. All right. Let's take a look at this one. Benchmarking is used to identify good practices across similar committees, not really. I mean, we didn't really say that. Organizations, yes. Techniques, kind of way. Procedures, right? But it's really looking at another company to see where, or the industry itself then, right? So the better answer here is benchmarking is used to identify good practices across similar organizations, right? Uh, I don't even have another one. I had highlighted that one. Uh, tell me if you're okay with that, because that one I think is okay, right? Um, if you have your book, you can turn the page. But that was on page 13, the uh, purpose of benchmarking. If you have your books, you can turn to page 14. Now, I notice all the cameras are off, which is OK. But just remember to take part in the session. If you have your cameras off, it's OK, right? But remember to respond. Remember to give me, because otherwise, I'll make you put it on, right? Uh, remember, the school is with the accreditation council. So with, with ACTT, you have to kind of have the cameras on. But this is not too much of a school course this is more like a mature kind of course right and it's sunday so you can have it off on and off but i should remember to take part when i give those sort of cues anyway right um so management of change uh, page 14. um so this this slide says it all and then everything else is just an explanation of this one slide right so management of change covers such as changes in process technology Changes the equipment and instrumentation. It, 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 it gets better to the end, right? Changes in process technology can result from changes in production rates, 
experimentation, equipment on availability. So you use whatever equipment you had, new equipment and changes in operating conditions to improve yield or um, quality. Okay, I think I missed a slide. So I'm going back to a slide because there was a better slide than this, right? So management of change to properly manage change of process, chemicals, technology, whatever it is, right? Equipment, people, facilities, one must define what is meant by change. If you can understand what is change, what it, then what is change? Well, then if that happens, well, then you need to document it. So then what is change, right? So in this process safety management standard, change includes all modifications, equipment, procedures, raw materials, and processing conditions, including, like I said, people training and stuff, other than what would have been normal conditions then or other than replacement in kind, right? So if a valve, you know, had, you know, like a, okay, not a valve, let me just use something simple. I'm talking too much process, right? So if, if you think of your cars and the battery in your car, right? So let's say you have one of those one year batteries. Of course you could have two year, three years as well, right? But if you have a one year battery, and you change that battery just when the year rolls over, that's not management of change because that's just you're replacing it, right? And if a valve, I go back to the valve example, or a sensor on a tank, a sensor on a line, you know, had like a two year lifespan. And then, you know, in the plan maintenance, which we call shutdown, the valve has been selected for change and it was changed. That's not management of change because that's just replacement in kind, right? So, Management of change is, is, is when you change something, is when you modify something that wasn't the normal change then, right? So they have all modifications, equipment, procedures, raw materials, and processes other than replacement in kind. And this time would have said, changes in process technology can result from change in production rates, experimentation, equipment, and availability, new equipment, and changes in operating conditions to improve yield you know, or quality. So if you say, so let's just go to the simplest one, right? Equipment unavailability. So a valve needed to change, right? You are custom using a particular brand of valve, let's say Lufkin, right? And you couldn't source that anymore, but then you got another one, right? You got a DeWalt or something. So that's not a normal replacement in kind, right? The valve developed a leak or something like that, right? Some fault was probably picked up and then it was changed, but then an MOC form needs to be filled out, right? You, you think you understand that a bit? The, the judge just let me know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't I think any... Yes, sir. Okay. If there is a flow rate, right? And we will get some better examples, right? I try not to draw any sketches as yet because I'll skip back the class. Um, so like if there's a flow rate, if it, okay, let's just go to Chubby, right? Say making SMG Lee, right? So SMG Lee uh making soft drink, right? And there's a certain percentage of sugar, there's a certain percentage of um, let me just write that one in the board. I won't draw any pipeline or anything as well, right? So let's say there's a percentage of sugar, there's a percentage of acid, right? That has to go into the product, right? I just put in 1%, but for those of us who know, SMG lead percent of acid is more than 1%, right? Uh, it's actually very acidic, right? Um, but we say 1%, I'm not, I'm not rating it in the pH scale, I'm just saying 1%. So it's not pH 1, it's just 1% for those who know the pH scale, right? And let's say there's a temperature for making soft drinks, I'm just going to call a figure. I think this is kind of close to it, about 21 degrees Celsius, right? But something, they did some experimentation, maybe the, the uh, research department is doing and they realize, well, perhaps um, if we could possibly increase the temperature a bit, right? Let's say it's about maybe 25 or let's say something decent, 23.5 degrees Celsius, right? And then perhaps, you know, also change this up a bit, right? Maybe drop this to about 0.8%. Well, that's what they got in experimentation and they realized, okay, the product, the catalyst, whatever they are using, right? But I don't think they use catalyst by the way, right? But there could be another process if they're making something else, right? So if they realize that, what I say, this here, ha a form had to be filled out for that. Because if you realize upon experimentation, when you can get a product in a shorter space of time, or it works pretty well and it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, like uh, cause too much of damage because the acid is now, the acid is now less. From from 1%, the acid is now less. And I'm, I'm talking about the, 
the the containers right so if the acids are being stored in containers or whatever so you know if, if you realize that whether well, MOC form have to be filled out because it is it is a change to the normal thing then it's a total change a form have to be filled out Let, yes sir Nikisa so welcome in Nikisa across there in Guyana so sir this will um this will be including the has up right because um from my understanding when you're looking at the MOC, right? And let's say you have to, well, I know for this specific course, um, I don't know if you do a risk assessment, but I know that this is where like the hazard comes in, yeah, where you detect yeah. where yeah. where you detect why this why, you know, the 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 um drinks or the beverage had an issue in the process. It yeah. would be the hazard form you're filling up in this instance, right, sir? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so I'm so glad that you remember. But anyway, so I was in Guyana last year. I did, Nikisa was in one of my sessions, an oil and gas session that we did cover the HAZAP. I do believe, I'll try to remember the heading in the HAZAP. I do believe, yes, it could be, the, the change could be considered in the HAZAP because with the change, you have to consider like if there's any impact, right? So impact doesn't have to be bad. And if you all, you all know that, right? Like an like impact assessment, doesn't have to be bad, like the impact could be actually good, right? So the hazard could consider the impact of the change, but then a change form still have to be filled out to say, look, you know, going forward, we are deviated from the manufacturer's instructions. We have done some sort of experimentation upon ourselves and we have realized that, you know, it's, it's oh, sorry for, for Nikesia, who may not know what Chubby is. So I don't know if you know what Chubby is, right? Chubby is a, 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 a soft yes, drink. I know. Okay, the you know, shark. I have soft to just drink. Yeah, this because, yeah. you know, I think you all are more custom, like you normally find more products from Canada on the Guyana uh, grocery shelves, then, right? So you have like Guyana does a lot of business with Canada, a lot of Canadian products. But like Grenada, Grenada have a, if you go to like a, a which, I mean, you go to like a grocery or so in, in Grenada. It's just Trinidad stuff you'll see. You'll think, you know, it's just like Trinidad stuff you'll see. But yeah, okay. So if you know what, so the, so, so the Chubby is a, is a brand of soft drink. Just when you say you know, right? I'm just making it clear that it's a brand of soft drink that we have anyway, right? And it, 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 is, ship, will, it is ship will like worldwide anyway. You can get it in the States as well, right? All right. So I think if you understand, folks, that the form have to be filled out, the only thing that's missing now is just to like see a form. Right, like this week, I remember I do consulting. I was out at a company doing store, and that's something they had to do. They had to do the auditors recommended um an MOC log, right? So we had the MOC form, but then they wanted like a log of all the MOCs that occurred in the company, which isn't much because this was a catalyst-based company, right? Um, for like Proman, so they don't really change much stuff, right? They don't really change what they do too, too much, right? It's not too much of stuff that's on the MOC log anyway, right? It's just a consistent method of working, all right? Um, so if I if you read out, you see a lot of changes, the equipment changes include amongst other others, changes in material of construction. But if there's a change, you need to have this, just follow the form, equipment specification, piping, pre-arrangements, experiment on equipment, computer program revision, and changes in alarms and interlocks. So once there's a change, and you know it wasn't like a replacement change, you fill out the MOC form, right? Employers need to establish means and methods to detect both technical changes and mechanical changes. Temporary changes have caused a number of catastrophes over the years. Yes, it have. You know, um, disasters, right? And employers need to establish ways to detect temporary changes as well as those that are permanent. Um, if it's a process operator, you'll pick it up in the process room, right? But then the process operators must know what to do with the sensors that are more or less, you know, coming on then, right? Temporary changes are subject to the management of change provision. In addition, the management of change procedures are used to ensure that the equipment and procedures are returned to the original or design condition at the end of the temporary change, right? Proper documentation and review of these changes is invaluable because if you lose the documents, then, you know, like, why did you make this change, right? A typical change form should include a description and the purpose of the change, 
the technical basis of the change. All of these could be headings, right? They're not going to ask you all of this. This is if you're doing it for real life. Health and safety considerations of the change, which is the impact. Documentation of changes for the operated procedures, maintenance procedures, inspection, and all of that is columns, columns and the MOC forms, right? Electrical classification, training and communication, because you change something. So are the operators now trained to handle this, right? Um, I'll give you one other story just now. Pre-startup inspection, PSSI, duration if a temporary change, approval and proper authorization of the um, change, right? I'm not too sure if you have heard about some of these disasters around the world, right? Um, I'll just give you one at the end, right? So let's just go straight to the form. You can read this out and you'll see, um, you know, this is like a, a situation Again, I don't expect it to give it this. I just put it here because I thought it was a nice one, right? A low pressure storage vessel is connected via pipe work to a manufacturing plant, which could, in the event of a malfunction, generate a pressure great enough to rupture the vessel. To prevent this, a pressure detector is installed in the low pressure storage vessel. If the pressure starts to rise above an acceptable level, the detector activates a valve control system. This in turn closes the inlet valve to the, va to the vessel, isolated, isolated it from excessive pressure. It has been estimated that the pressure great enough to rupture the low pressure storage vessel will be generated once every four years on average, right? So like if there was like um, a change to the detectors, then I almost see for me to be filled out. This is just like a scenario, right? Um, if something with the valve change or you couldn't find the valve, you have to fill out an MOC form. And really, this is actually a question from our degree class. Um, you know, like even the last line, which, which have none to do with you all, right? So the last line, it has been estimated that um, pressure great enough to erupt a low pressure storage vessel would be generated once every four years on average. Now, they could actually prove that. There's actually a way to calculate that at the degree level that the, like the vessel is good for four years, then you have like a warranty for four years because you can get a rupture every four years, right? So part of the ETA calculation I was talking about is used to suggest warranties or products if you know how to do it. But like I say, it's not all covered in this course anyway. All right. Um, so very, very basic here. Um, because again, it's not as if they're gonna ask you. You could just pull it back on my slides if anybody wants to make up an MOC form. You could just go and Google it, by the way, or just take what I have here and put it in columns, right? But uh, very simple, because there's multiple choice. Typical MOC form will have like, the description of the MOC, who is the MOC owner, right? The person that, you know, sort of proposed that change, authorization. But it could be other things, you know, like the impact of the change, um, you know, the... Uh, well, the impact is probably the same as the risk, right? So the impact of the change, um, who is the supplier, who are the new suppliers, right? Who is the new product? What's the new training program? All of those could be part of the uh, MOC form, right? But literally, they don't ask too much questions or not. They just ask things like, um, they just give you something like a company, you know, is using a valve and the valve is no longer available. They have decided to source another supplier, for multiple choice, what form would best, you know, describe or capture this change, right? And the answer is the MOC form. There isn't too much of questions in MOC, right? Uh, but it's part of the course, so we have to cover it anyway. And with multiple choice, I did say Nibos repeat the questions, but they're often free to make new questions. I don't think it's a difficult concept. I think it's something that you all should get along with as well, right? Um, next one, if you turn the page. Uh, worker engagement, page 16, if you don't have the book, just look at the slide. Worker engagement. Under the benefits and limitation of consultation with workers and contractors, right? So let me just explain this slide because remember, like it's not as if they're going to ask you what is the law, right? But what you're seeing here, if you just take a look at the slide, that there are many laws that say the employers must consult them with the workforce, right? And uh, I'll just show those some of them. We have the Safety Representative and Safety Committee Regulations, 1977, 
this is a very popular one. Everybody sort of knows this one if you did NIBOR suit, right? Or NIBOR diploma. The Health and Safety Consultation with Employee Regulations 1996. This is the Health and Safety at Work Act, Section 2, Subsection 3. This is where we got our OSHAC from, right? For, for those of us who don't know, you know, Trinidadians didn't really write the OSHAC. And Guyanese didn't write the Guyana OSHAC either. Right? It was all thought about. It was all thought about by somebody in the UK. We didn't put pen to paper. We did not. When I say we, Guyana, Trinidad, America, Canada, anybody that Grenada, Jamaica, right? Anybody that have an OSHAC, right? The locals then never put pen to paper and say, there was nobody here then that say the employer duty is to provide safe plans and safe systems of work. Nobody here did that, right? Nobody here did. I'm going to call some details here in part two of the OSHA. For Guyana, I think it's section 45, Trinidad is part two, right? Things like providing information, training, instruction, supervision. We, we didn't think about that. We actually did, right? Uh, all of the good things in the act provided safe access, egress. Providing welfare facilities. We, we didn't, it sounds as if it sounds good, but we didn't think about it. It was all thought about by the British, right? And one particular person was Lord Reuben, right? But he used different titles across it. But Reuben was the person that was spearheaded to write the act, right? Which, which they call the HSW Act, and which the world took that. If they talk about benchmark, like the world took that as a pattern, including America. Now, why did they do that, right? But we all could guess, right? Why did they use the UK? Well, England, really England, because Scotland have one too, right? But like, why did they use England as a benchmark? And the answer is, well, we were under the British, Guyana, Trinidad, Grenada still under the British, right? Grenada doesn't have a president. So the King of England is the head of Grenada and St. Lucia and St. Vincent, right? Trinidad is a republic, Green Guyana is a republic, Barbados is a republic, right? So we have a president, right? But the point is that when, when countries then became independent and a republic and it was time to have an act, we just took back what was here before, the HSW Act, all right? And then, of course, that went to parliament and got it, its approval. And these are now, respectively, laws here in Trinidad, 2004, and many 2006, and Guyana, 1997, right, would be the app. Green, um, Green Aider is actually 2015. I, I actually worked on that one. But it wasn't much to work on because you remember you just, so when somebody said you work on the app, they already work on the app. You, you just pattern it, it over the HSW app because that's what everybody does, right? So when you see it, somebody, so the everything that's a big thing is just that you just, you just get them to approve what, what, what they want in the app. And what they want in the app is the same thing as what the rest of the world is saying. Same thing that I just said, safe access, egress, safe Latin equipment, right? Duty of employees. So it's the same thing. So it wasn't written here. It's all patterned over the UK Act, right? So the long and short of that story is that we, 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 we ordered the OSH Act to, to Lord Rubin, right? Back in 1970. Yeah, he died in 1999, right? And if, if you think 1999, well, for some people, 1999 is, a, is, is like a, a, a world away. Right, but have you all seen the movie Matrix? Have like have you all ever seen the movie Matrix? Yeah, we must have. I mean, have you all seen the movie Matrix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the new one. <laughs> well, yeah, not. I mean, the new one is good too, right? But the original one, I think everybody have seen that one. Or what year was that? That's nineteen ninety nine. So if you have seen the movie Matrix, I don't think you're that badly off, right? So, I mean, I don't think you're that old, right? So 1999 was the year that Lord Rupert died, the guy who wrote the act for the world, but it was, wasn't for the world at first, it was for England. And then of course, when countries became you know, uh, independent and a republic and wanted their own act, then they took that from them. So, so the long and short of the story is, let's get them back to this slide, is that um, they, they, so there are many laws then to say the employer must consult with the employees and contractors as well. Right. The last one, if you don't know the meaning of those letters, it's construction, design and management, CDM. Construction, design and management. HSW stands for the Health and Safety at Work Act. That was the first Health and Safety at 
work act it had like in the world then right the year for that is 1974 before that it had the factory ordinances right but in terms of an act that kind of had that universal appeal right was the hsw act cdm again folks these are not exam question you don't have to write it you don't have to write nothing on this slide all you have to remember on this slide is that consultant with the workers is a legal obligation right and there are many laws that say that i think last week we did a question similar to this and I was telling you all that um, this may not be the best answer. What I mean by that? Like the law itself might not be the best answer for worker engagement, right? The way the British see it, right? So the way the British see it, anybody remember from last week? So all of these laws sound nice, right? All of them, all of them, right? They all sound nice. But the way the British see it, they see the legal like obligation or the legal responsibility on an employer to consult with the employees is the least you could do. So if a question asks what is the most important, I think we saw that, what is the most important benefit of worker engagement? And it says compliant with the law. That's not correct. Because the British just think different to us. You know, like we see the law as everything. The law, the law is the end of it, but not them. They see the law as the least. The, the law is the least you could do, right? If you're but I mean, we must have paid attention because it's in the news again, the Commission of Inquiry, it's in the Paria thing, which we're not going to talk about here. But I draw in reference to the chairman. If, if you have seen the chairman, if vaguely you remember the chairman, anybody remember the chairman of that, um, of, 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 of that process? Any, anybody remember his name? If you can't remember his name, try to, try to remember what he looks like. And, and tell me, the chairman of the Commission of Inquiry into the Parry incident. What was his name? If you can't remember his name, I'm trying to make a point here. Right? And if you can't remember his name, what, what did he look like? Is he from Trinidad? Is he from Ghana? No, I believe he from, well, he had an accent, like from, from England, I believe. Correct. Yeah, he was <laughs> bald head and he had a kind of... <laughs> yeah, he's from the UK. Bald head, a kind yeah. of stone pose, yeah. person kind of look, yeah. But he's from the UK, right? And if you listen to him, well, you know, you have to go back and I love the British, right? I've spent some time there. They are very good when it comes to standards, right? Of course, you know, the British did a lot of stuff in the region that wasn't good. But when it comes to standards, right? If you listen to him talk, he couldn't believe there is this disbelief so Trinidad, that's like normal. There's this disbelief that the workers could have gotten into the dive and not fill out a permit to work form. There is this disbelief and shock that an adjacent process could have been started without the workers coming out of the dive, right? There's this belief and shock because if you know how a permit operates, you don't operate a permit to work like that. Right now, permit is part of not today's lesson. Permit is part of lesson three, but there are certain things that a permit require. There, there's a, like if you remember again, there's this disbelief because the safeties who were talking in that, and I'm not going to call any names. I know the names, and there are people here that probably know the names too. The safeties were saying, well, they just will copy like the toolbox meeting form, and when they the custom was when they come out and they die like three o'clock or whatever, then they fill it out. But that's not what toolbox or what GSA or meta statement is meant to be. So there is this disbelief in him that he couldn't believe, right? And, and for us, the safeties, I know them, and the safeties are the just there talking, you know. So that's a normal thing. And he was, there's this disbelief that how could this be, right? So there is the Ashak of Trinidad, I think, well, of Trinidad, and there's the one in Guyana, but how could it be? The, the, so what I'm trying to create is that. The law is there, but is, the law is the minimum, right? What, what I'm trying to say is that he holds a higher standard. He holds like a moral obligation and on the employer that they should have. They, it, like they should have done the toolbox meeting. They should have followed the, the requirements of the permit. You can't just say it have the OSHAC and the OSHAC requires this, 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 and this. But yes, it have. But then that's just the least you could do, Right. If you see anything again on Facebook, the next time you see it, go back and watch it. Go back and watch it and hear the tone in his voice, right? I was trained by somebody from the UK who was, who was actually the head of OSHA, but part of it was in the UK. I haven't seen him. The last time I saw him was in Grenada, 2015. He probably retired by now. If anybody here, I don't I have some folks in OSHA here, but he, like, he actually taught um, Brisbane. Brisbane and I... For, for those who know Brisbane, France, Brisbane is the head of, I think the chairman of OSHA now, but Brisbane was taught 
Well, we were in the same school. I was really taught by the guy, but Brisbane was one of our lecturers. Years ago, yeah? Years ago, people, yeah? this is more than a decade ago, right? Franz Brisbane was the head of, um, is the head of OSHA in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, um, uh, uh, so am I correct with this? I think he's a chairman, right? Franz Brisbane is a chairman, but it's got have people that could correct me here. here uh, yes, yes, he is. Yeah, good. And then, and yes, then 10 years ago, more than 10 years, and it's been in 15 years now, he was a lecturer for me. But then he was taught, like we were taught by a guy from the UK, right? So I was taught, but then I worked with the guy. So, that, so it's not just taught in the sense, for me, it was more like a mentor. He was like my, like I was, he, he was the principal. I was like the vice principal, right? So I worked with him for a number of years. If anybody remember his name, Sid Sears. Anybody remember his name? Sid Sears? Or was it so long ago now? Does it ring a bell for those in Ocean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen Sid in years, I'll tell you. The last time, for 2015 in Grenada, I was, I was going to a job, I was going to train uh, Grand Lake, which is the Grenada Electricity Company in Irish Managing Safely. And they moved me from my seat. That's how strange it was, right? They, they changed my seat. And uh, it's kind of weird. I think they had to be gone because when they put me, they changed my seat and I sit, I was sitting by somebody. I, they moved and put me by somebody. Yes, and when I looked across, it was Sid. I was like, Sid, what are you doing here? Okay, he's not supposed to be, I mean, he's, he's not in the region. It's like, Sid, where are you going? <laughs> right? He was only coming to Trinidad um, on a connected flight anyway, right? So we spent the whole flight talking. People all around us could have heard us talking because it was years I haven't seen him. And then that was actually 2015. It's been years since I've seen him since that anyway, right? So I try to tell you here, the point about this is that legal is not the best answer, right? There's often legal is the least you could do. And draw those two illustrations there to... Uh, to, to, to like, I guess to some British men then, right? To like uh, Sid and to the Lynch is a guy named the uh, the, the Commission of Inquiry into the Parry incident, right? Lynch is the person's name. So they have that sense about them that we locals see the law as everything, but the British do. They see it as the least. So I hope you remember the story because it is a past paper question. So when you see it for exam, now it will be concrete in your mind that the law is never the best, right? The law is the least you can do. And as a human being, you can do more than that because the thing here is worker engagement. You don't engage workers because it's the law. You engage them because you want to develop a sense of belonging. You want to develop the culture of your company. You want the person to feel valued. There are more reasons than to engage workers than saying it is the law. And I say all of that to tell you that it was a passive person because you did remember it. Hopefully you remember it from last week, right? Benefits of consultation, increased productivity. So all of this is easy. Improvement in overall efficiency, high level of workforce motivation, a healthier and safer workplace. Your employees can help you identify hazards and assess risk and develop ways to control or remove risk, right? So you can read all this. So why does I read it? Because remember, you will have your four, right? It's not as if they're gonna, this is just information, but you will have your four. And you can pick the best one. The best one is always going to be where you get the workers' input. You know, like you hear their, their views to possibly get the job done in a safer way. I think that's where the question came, right? So you can read out um, benefits of worker consultation. Look, the question was here. The most important benefit of worker engagement when undertaking a risk assessment is the avoidance of conflict. Yes, that's true, but it probably isn't the most important. A balanced representation of workers and managers, yes. Compliance with law, well, after all those stories, I tell you, you should know what does not the answer. Detailed knowledge input regarding practical workplace hazards and risks, right? So you kind of get, the, the question is worker engagement, right? So this would be the best one. If you think you have any issues with it, uh, with passive, try to kind of be familiar with it because remember they repeat it. It's like if they repeat it, well then fine, you just, Click it and you move on. Yeah, your thing is just to click, right? On the internet, it's just to click your answers, right? It's not a shade, it's like a pencil you have, right? Because remember, it's a computer based exam. All right. Um, but wherever you see passivas, you know, always remember to run through it. By the way, too, um, if we haven't done it, to the end of every chapter, there are some questions, and these are questions from the book itself. 
So like this question is in your book. If you have your book page 21, if you want, just take a look at it so that you know what your book has. Right, you'll see some questions there on page 21, but to the end of every chapter. So like when you finish chapter two, you could just turn to the end of the chapter, you'll see some questions again. I have some participants to send to you all. I think I sent one to you all already, right? Um, maybe today we could probably pause a little bit and do some when we finish of this lesson anyway, right? Let's just try to finish it off though. All right, so if you can look at your book and the answers are there too, but you have to turn the page. If you're on page 21, so like in chapter two, in chapter three, in chapter four, just turn the page. The page with the questions, just turn the page and you'll see they, they publish the answers to the bottom. So if you're on page, if, if, if you're in chapter two, let's say do some further reading, you're going to see some questions in the end of the chapter. If you want to find the answer, if you're making some guesses and you want to just see if it was correct, just turn the page. Well, if you're in chapter two, it'd be a different page, but in chapter one, this is page 22. The one we just did, this one here, that question is actually number four. For number four, they did say the answer was D, right? So that could be some ways, right? And please, I do encourage you all. Um, like I said, we do not do any uh, huge advertising. Nibosh has a life of its own, right? We, we, I mean, we do Facebook ads. We used to be on the Express a lot. Trinidad Express ad is a newspaper. We used to be on one of the local stations a lot. But, you know, like, like a way, really is like you carrying your book with you. If you carry your book and work, if that's possible, some companies might not allow that. But you know, if you can do that, sometimes that's the best form of advertising that you know somebody that did the course and pass. You know, that's like the best form of advertising. We, we have an advertising machine, but oftentimes the advertising machine is placed on other courses, not too much on process safety, right? Sometimes the advertising machine is placed on the NIBOSH certificate. That's like the main, you know, driver in the school anyway, or the Irish managing safely, right? But like I said, I mean, whatever you do, that is also, you know, a source of helping out the school as well, right? Limitations of consultation with employees. So can lead to conflicts or arguments, can be time consuming. Employees and contractors may seek alternative means of getting the task done. Consultation limited to process safety management and not anything else that can damage the employer's reputation and image. For example, civil cases or legal matters should not, I mean, if it's in the court and getting into legal proceedings, it should not be something that, you know, is to be consulted with a contractor about, right? Contractor workers may have sensory impairment. You can't discriminate against them because you have equality acts in different parts of the world. In the UK, it's Equality Act 2010. You can't discriminate against someone, but you have to find ways to communicate effectively with them then, right? So that's the idea there anyway, right? Uh, limitations of consultation can result in confidential information being leaked through the grapevine. Subcontractors may require additional information as the process, sorry, as the information passed on from the main contractor to subcontractors may vary or be lost in translation varied aims and objectives between the contractor's policy and the requirement of the process plant, PSM policy development. Process safety performance indicators may be different initially to that of the contractor. And that's okay because you have to agree on what are the indicators you want to work with. And in most cases, if it is a contractor, they should follow the standards of the client, unless if the contractor standard is higher than the client, in which case I think you missed enough to follow the client requirement, right? But um, this, this is a nice thing here for those who know, like I said, still have element one, have this in it, where if there is like different aims of the contractor and a client, you have to agree on what aim you're going at then, right? So if you, if you want, I can do one, right? If you want, I can give you one, even though this is really chapter two a bit, right? So like process safety performance indicators, if a contractor then standard is that they're going to, let's just use the, use the permit, but I want to use it the right way. I wouldn't want to use it the wrong way. So the permit to work, right? So uh, process safety member is not being high risk work. So if this is a vessel, the permit is to be used. Uh, the first thing in a permit, anybody knows anything on a permit form? There's something very important in a form. Um, it, it, makes, it makes a difference. If, if you do that one thing, your job is safe. 
Anybody knows what that is? There's, there's only the main things on a permit. Besides PPE and stuff, there's exactly one thing. If you do that one thing, your job is safe. If you're an electrician, if, if you are getting into a vessel, right? A tank, a vessel, well, a vessel, a line, right? What is that one thing a permit requires that could make your job safe? On permits, you have confined space entry. You have to uh, right. take that box. Um, so that is very one important aspect, yeah. the number of persons that is involved yeah. in the task. You have yeah. to have the supervisor who is going to oversee that job. Yeah. You also need to have um, the emergency response. Um, right. So emergency. very good. That's a lot of them. Yeah. So all yes. of those are headed on that field, right? right? But there's one thing. Like if they, I just tried to draw like a vessel or something, right? So like a line coming into this tank here. So we want to go into this tank. Right, and we come to get inside it. What is the one thing you have to do? But this is a flow line. What is the one atmospheric thing? testing? Yes, but that's not the one thing. This is a flow line. What is the one thing you have to do? You all know it, uh, Good. The lockout tagout. Yeah, um, lockout tagout, right? So, what is lockout tagout? Lockout tagout speaks to one thing. That one thing is isolation. What is isolation? Isolation is what it just said. Isolation means locking off and prevent it from being turned back on. So imagine if that was done in Paria. But those don't know, right? But that's what they breach. They breach isolation, right? They put on an adjacent something, create a disruption in the lines that, well, you know the rest of the story, right? For those of us who know it, right? So if somebody was getting here, yes, the atmospheric testing. Yes, the supervision. Yes, the PPE. But you have to isolate. You have to turn off that flow. Whatever it is, like I said, if it was even electricity, this could have been something else, somebody working on a process or whatever, right? A panel box or whatever, right? You have to isolate. Isolate means lock. But for, 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 for those of us who know it, lotto, lock out, and tag out. If you don't know what that is, well, it's a real lock, right? You can actually close this valve. Some companies, they remove the head of the valve and they put a lock and a chain on it, and it's a tag. You can buy the tag because they do sell it. There's actually a device called a lockout tag or device, but you can make the tag too. Most companies will buy the tag. It's a real tag with a chain that you put on the valve, right? The part that you sort of locked out anyway that says do not open there. And the only person to open this, the only time when this isolation have to be lifted is when the men come out of that tank. You can't lift an isolation, which is what they did. And as I tell you, that's a lynch. The guy never so in this belief that this thing could happen, right? Because it are not more law here, and I just have to do with what is right. How could you put on back the flow? If you look, look at my tank, right? And a mechanic or some well or some laborer right inside it. A laborer is inside it cleaning the base of the tank. For those of who know, a base of a tank does have a lot of sludge in it, right? So laborers are there, and yes, you have to isolate, and yes, you have emergency rescue, but you can't do any of that. The most important thing is isolation. This is actually chapter two, right? But I try to tell you here that um, you know, it's it's all about it's all about the example of a contractor. The contractor, you know, you know, is of the opinion, like I said, like maybe proper supervision. But I'm saying the client, the client requires lockout and tag out. But if it's a higher standard, the contractor have to agree to that higher standard, right? And the other thing here, the reason for bringing this up is that if there's adjacent contractors. A copy of the permit have to be sent to the adjacent contractor. So let's say there was somebody else here. There's another flow line inside here with another process. For those of us who know, these things are called manifold. A manifold is like more than one way to get something into something else, right? So if you have a manifold system of lines, well, a copy of the permit, if you are here, right, in a certain part of Georgetown, and then there's another line flowing in there, a copy of the permit has to be given to the other person in the other location. You cannot just accidentally put it on because that's when you will kill the men and them. And that's what happened. Not just in Trinidad, you know, it happened in the UK too. It happened all over the world. A simple document and a, a permit to work, a piece of paper, a piece of paper could save your life. And that's how some people think about a permit. For those of us who are in the companies, people think about a permit in many ways. And a permit is said to be permit to work, but some people call it power to work. Some people say permission to work, right? It's a very important piece of paper. If that paper was followed, right? And everybody knew, okay, look, the men and them in the vessel still there. They are come out here. The only time this valve open is when you come out and you sign in there. You are the sign on that permit that you out of that vessel. 
how how like how the valve open and you're still in the vessel, right? So that this is the disbelief I tell you about, about about the commission of inquiry because this is how the thing is meant to operate. This is how it's supposed to work. This is how the PTW is supposed to work. But if you're doing your own thing, if you want to do your own thing, but then that's when you'll cost people their life, lives, in fact. It happened in the UK too, in a BP, right? Piper Alpha, another one. Remember we read that one, 167 people died. That, that was a permit to work in. They didn't pass the permit from the day shift to the night shift, right? A piece of paper that say the line in Piper Alpha was, was not, you know, good for use then. But the night shift didn't know that they put it on because the permit wasn't passed on to them. So as I'm saying, different views between contractors and employees, you kind of have to stick to the higher view anyway, right? Um, all of these, I kind of went through this a bit here because I know this is a particular question, right? Um, you know, a permit to work is meant for high-risk activities. That's a particular question. The most important aspect of a permit, even it have plenty other headings, it have more headings, signatures, authorized person. The most important thing on a permit is isolation, lockout and tag out. But what you're doing if you didn't isolate? What you're doing in an electrical box if you didn't isolate the, the um, current supply? Supervisors could be looking at you and they too could get shock and die, right? So the most important thing is isolation, but you would see it again in chapter three. Right? I'm taking off this from here, right? Um, any comments, anybody? You might ask, what is a motor? It's a Any questions? Any comments? Okay, all right. Moving on. All right. I think I'll, I, I want to go to the last concept. Looking at the time, if we can just go down to the last concept. So you can read all about this. Um, types of persons to consult with. I'll read some for you. It's basically everybody. Contractors, unions, HSE officials, employees, right? Um employer responsibility to contractors. When selecting a contractor, the employer must obtain and evaluate information regarding the contract's employer's safety, performance, and program. The employer must also inform contractors of any known potential fire, explosion, or toxic release hazards related to the contractor's work and the process. Explain to the contractors the applicable provision of the emergency action plan. Uh, employer's responsibility to contractors develop and implement safe work practices. That's the top of it, right? Uh, evaluate on a periodic basis the performance of contractors and fulfilling their obligation. Maintain a contract employee injury and illness log. Perform a pre-safety or pre-startup safety review for new facilities, for modified facilities, and the modification, or when the modification is significant enough, to require a change in the process safety information. Contractor responsibility ensure that, con this is the contractors not themselves, ensure that contract employees are instructed in what the employer told them about the fire, you know, explosion hazards, document that each contract employee has received and understood the training required by the standard by preparing a record that contains the identity of the contract employee, the date of training, uh, the means used to verify that the employee understood the training, which is like an evaluation form that's kind of coming up to the end, right? Ensure that each contract employee follow the safety rules of the facility, including uh, the required safety work practices required in the operating procedure section of the standard and advise the employee of any unique hazards present or presented by the contract employee's work. Means of consultation, you can just talk to them, have a safety committee, team briefing, digital media, Zoom, Skype, whatever have you, right? Toolbox meeting. Uh, worker engagement should be given highest priority by management as it is a legal requirement. Additionally, it can foster an environment of positive PSM culture, can result in fewer accidents as employees are on board with the PSM policy aims and objectives. Management should ensure that arrangements are made for the engagement what might that entail? And the answer is it might entail these same things here. It may entail, sorry, I'm going back, right? It may entail a safety group, uh, a meeting, right? So that you have that consultation with the workers, right? Competence, uh, we have, um, well, the only way to really judge competence and process safety or any other fields that are ordered. So competence, 
is a combination of practical and thinking skills, experience and knowledge. Competence in the context of process safety is defined as a set of capabilities, skills, experience, knowledge, and the willingness to follow rules and procedures which will provide the necessary ability or abilities to enable individuals to potentially perform certain tasks, right? Anyway, so just getting into the last concept. Um, if you want to try to look at it in your book first, I'll try to look at it in your book. The last concept in this part of it, right? So 1.6 competence, if, if you have it, 1.6 page 18. I'm gonna to try to finish and then I'll try to come back to something here, right? When I say finish, I'll try to finish it for Nibosha, but there's something I wanted to ask here, which is kind of off the topic, but like I'm not gonna ask it anyway, right? So have you all seen page six, sorry, page 18, 1.6, take a look at it, page 19, you'll see something looking like this. So what are they trying to tell you, right? So just to break it down for you, they are trying to suggest to you here that you could sort of improve the competence of your workers with what we call a training needs analysis, right? This shouldn't be the first time you're hearing about that, right? A training needs analysis is like on a yearly basis, a company will look at all of the employees and their positions and suggest training for them. You will have things that you did already, right? You'll have things like you may have done um, for the same, I'm just making this thing up, right? But for process safety, it'll be things related to process safety then, right? Which is why I tell you the plants are using the Nibosh course as a thing to do then because it will develop their competence then, right? So that's what this is all about. So um, the name of the scheme though, uh, not too sure if you all heard me say it. The, so the name of it, the simplest name is a TNA, training needs analysis, right? The simplest name is a training needs analysis, but in this course, they call it a PSCMS. So if it, if it's literally book, you keep seeing that PSC process safety competence, right? A process safety competence management scheme. But it is the same thing, right? It is it is it is a TNA because what you do, you sort of map all your employees with what they have to do, right? So it includes skills and knowledge on human factors or human factor issues, as for instance, avoiding conflicting goals. Handling of unforeseen events. So this may be more for managers. Situational awareness, avoiding fatigue. Good man, machine interface. That is probably more for managers anyway, right? So let me try to show you one. I do have one here. The book has a nice one too. You want to just look at the one in your book? So you'll see here different levels that like managers would require certain training like IOSH managing safely, right? The PSE MS would have to consider all the different positions in the company and try to match a training to the person then, right? So trying to get down to one here. So you see one here, competent, a, competence areas where their different levels can be linked with the rules. This, this can be done via the TNA or the matrix then, right? Or the PSCMS. So process supervisors, level of competence they did one, two, three. Uh, chemical reaction, process supervisor may have level two knowledge, process operator level one knowledge, plant manager level one, PSC specialist, I guess. So I guess three would be the highest level of knowledge, right? So three, right? You're not getting one to do, right? You're not, I just trying to show you a concept. The book have one, two, the book have a nice one there too. If you can look at yours, right? All you have to remember because there's multiple choice, will actually like, um, a company is looking to improve its competence. You know, like they are going to map the different levels of management to, search, to such training that is needed. What's the name of the system? What's the best system, right? And they may use the word TNA or they may give you PSEMS. And that's, remember, it's multiple choice. You're not going to get to construct a TNA or to construct a management system for training. But it's just to say that this is the system used to improve training then, right? So like even for this course, I was telling you like um, process safety management and is being used for technicians throughout Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana as well, right? Um, it may be other things like some companies have just done the hazard. Some companies, if you look at root, sorry, uh, exothermic reactions, mandatory for the, uh, the operation manager, mandatory for the EHS specialist, 
project engineer could be recommended, the RDA is recommended, right? So anything you do like that is a management scheme and it is used to improve training from year to year or competence from year to year in a company. Tell me if you understand, I did skip a lot of it because I know, unlike the diploma students, you all don't have to, it's not as if you, okay, like a diploma class will get, what is the nine steps? But you're not getting that, right? You're getting what is the name of the system that is used to bridge the gap then, or to even improve, I wouldn't say bridge the gap, but maybe to improve competence in safety. And we could say process safety here because they use a TNA in, in normal safety as well. But the only difference is that the subject matter here, now you, you notice the courses are different, right? The courses here, it's not like first aid. It could be, but because it's process safety, they will have more process safety things to do then, right? They'll have more process safety knowledge, like fundamentals of process safety, advanced risk assessment techniques, root cause analysis, right? So the, so the courses are different or the training is different because it's more unique to the process safety field, right? The acid test is this. If you can do a past paper, well, then you understand without reading every single word then because the words are meant to come to the past paper, right? See if we can catch this one, see if we understand this one, um, and see if we can get the answer for this one, right? So I think I have two. No, I have one, right? But I've seen those questions that use PSEMS as well. But this one is the most common one. I try not to give the answer, but it right here looking at you. What was the answer for this one? Anybody, what's the answer for this one? You could just put it in the chat. Or you could tell me if you're still there or you didn't fall asleep. B, a trainer needs analysis. Right, okay, so it can't get easier than that, right? A trainer needs analysis is the answer. But just remember what I told you that they do also different passive person will say different things and they do say, um, you know, PSEMS as well, right? Process safety management, competence management scheme as what well they book have it, but they're just as a past paper and the past paper said, training needs analysis, right? Um, as I told you before, there's another question. Folks, if you want, you know, I am, um, this chapter one is finished here, here, right? So you can read all the rest, right? Um, Training programs can be standard, non-standard emergencies. And uh, that's kind of the way it is for most companies. You can have your standard training courses, your non-standard training courses, which would address things like, um, kind of like maybe like an MOC training where something came up and it wasn't taught about. They have to use a substitute. Then you have training for emergencies as well, right? Uh, let's take a look at a passive. I um, sometimes promise it then I don't get to it, right? Uh, but as we finish there, we can take a look at this one. I think I have sent this to y'all as well. Um, if yours says 2023, it's the same thing. I hope it is, right? If not, just look at this one, right? Because they do repeat the questions anyway, right? Let's try this one here. And uh, if we can just get, um, I, I want to go back and teach though, right? I want to go back and teach something. But if we can get, um, if we can get, Five done, I'll be happy, right? Okay, five. Number one, I read in and you just given me the answer, right? Which of the following best describes workplace consultation? A, two-way exchange of information between employer and worker. B, resolving of workplace disputes between employer and worker. C, appraisals of performance between employer and worker. Uh, D, employer regularly, employer, sorry, regularly keeping workers informed about safety issues. Always pay attention to the question, right? The question is, um, what is, which of the following best describes workplace consultation? What's the best answer you think? A. A, okay. A, A is the answer. Now, A. If, if you don't have this in front of you, what you could do, I don't know how you're going to record it, but remember, folks, passive as a vital. Um, you know, passive buzz is like a taxi driver picking up people and not collecting money. You, you can't do that. You cannot pick up people and not collect money if he's a taxi driver, right? So you cannot do this course and not do a passive. But because, you see, if, if it wasn't coming back, fine. 
but it's coming back. You can get 20 repeated questions, which is a big help, right? So if, if you have this paper, if you don't, the one you have, you can try, right? And send it in to me. Well, when I say try, I don't know if you can do so much as yet, but whatever you do, you can take a little pity of it. If you do five questions of what I was doing here, take a pity and send it for me. Even they do all want to do, to do a whole past paper, but then you see we still in, not finished chapter one, so you, you don't know too much of everything then, right? But the good news of multiple choice is that the answer there, but sometimes even if you haven't done chapter two or chapter three as yet, you can still work your way out of it then. It's just a guess. And if you're doing it for me, you're doing it for me. You're not doing it for Nibosh. I will just put the correct answer for him, right? Number two, which of the following is likely to be most helpful in developing a positive health and safety culture? Which of the following is likely to be most helpful in developing a positive health and safety culture. That's like common sense, right? Let's read them out and see. Senior managers created workforce fear of disciplinary proceedings. What do you think? Yes or no? No. 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 High level communication chains with diluted messages at lower levels. That I mean, the message shouldn't be diluted. I think that's no, right? Yeah. Promotion of safety, sorry, process safety leadership at board level visibility of site visits. Kind of like that one, right? D, management focus on productivity, not on reasonable safety regulations. So the best so, answer I see. That's what I'm telling you. Now, this and that person mm -hmm. was chapter one and that was the PDC, a thing on leadership, right? So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes it just sounds right now. That's the beauty about multiple choice, right? I told her before, when I first brought this course to Trinidad, Atlantic LNG. Anyway, companies ran with this because this is a level four qualification. And a level four is higher than the Nibosh level three, but the exam is easier. If you had noticed, because I do have some of my level three students here, let me just show them all. <laughs> I have Callister, he's in my level three. Well, finish, pass. I mean, these guys finish and pass. Nikesia in Guyana is also a level three student that passed. And uh, what they could tell is that passing level three was, 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 you know, damn hard. But this is level four. The work is deeper than level three. You'll see that, but the exam is easier. So it's easier to get level four than to get level three. For now, unless anybody decides to change this and make it into a written exam, for now it's multiple choice, right? Number three, process safety involves a commitment to continuous. I like this question, right? Because we didn't do it before. Process safety involves, we did something like this in, in the PowerPoint. Process safety involves a commitment to continuous what? Impartiality, improvement, improvisation, implementation. Process improvement. safety involves a commitment to continuous. Improvement. Right. So you see folks, not everything is hard. It will have tricky questions in it. But probably not chapter one. That's how you know we reach here. It will have tricky questions in it, right? But it will have those that that's not telling nobody does feel process safety in it. Well, nobody in a long time. It actually had people that feel right, but nobody in two years. This is three years now. For the last two years, nobody didn't feel process safety, right? Once you study a little bit, you're good to go, and you use your common sense. You're good to go. It will have new things, huh? When I reach them at PDC, I'll tell you it have new things in chapter two, it have new things in chapter three, it have things you have to learn, right? But once you learn them, they're good to go, right? What is the main reason for sharing lessons learned from major incidents at other organizations? I think we did this one. Let me see if it's the same question. It is the same question, right? Um, yeah, it yeah. was B. Potential yeah. benefits, yeah, are greater for the whole world. You don't have to learn from what happened to BP. Or Texas City, all of those, are, we have to look at some of those videos as well. But if you're learning about the permit to work, like you're supposed to send an adjacent copy to the contractor. No one should be putting on a valve and you show the men and them come out of the dive. Madness. That is what Lynch and them said. It was madness. They can't believe. I can't believe it too because we train under that same system. Number five, and we'll stop with this one, right? Um, the key elements of a process safety management system 
follow the plan to check at model. See if you can do the watch back in bucket. Management review aligns itself with which part of the model? Which part is management review? Or you can just knock off the one that you think was wrong. Is it plan? Is it plan? I don't think so. Yes. No. 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 Okay. So it knock off it. Is it? No, no, sir. Is it C check? So then the answer is D. Ah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What 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 was what was D supposed to be? I think I explained that to y'all. Act supposed to be what? Is is act really act? Is act really act? Act is action. Action to improve. Right? I tell you, I, I didn't make a the chat. I just tell you, whoever the guy called, I think his name was Demon. I think he was trying to make an acronym, plan do check act. But act is not act. Act is actually short for action to improve. Right? So if you don't understand that, you may get this wrong because, but I mean, y'all who are here, you're supposed to know, right? Act is short for action to improve. That's why lessons learned fall under that. Management review fall under that. It, it, don't, it don't really mean act as to go and do something. It don't mean do a risk assessment, like act and complete a risk assessment, no. So if you don't understand act is not act at all, act is actually short for action to improve. Then you understand, well, if it's action to improve, but then management review falls under that, right? Folks are going back a little bit to the theory. Um, I have about less than 15 minutes. I'm going to share PowerPoint too. If you have a couple minutes, just oh, to number four. Say, say again? Number four. I didn't get oh. number four. Oh, I okay. Anybody remember what's number four? I let me go back to it. Four was B. Four was B. Okay, I'll just take B, your B, 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 B. 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 I'm back. Okay. Back. Okay. I'm back. Yeah. yeah. Four, four, yeah. Four potential benefits. Why would you share lessons? Because you learn from others. So the benefit, if you learn from a world disaster, then right, then you don't have to wait for that to happen in your plant. So the potential benefits of learning lessons are greater for the whole process safety world and the whole industry itself. So you wouldn't have to wait for your oil field rig to burn down then to learn a lesson, but you learn from Piper Alpha, right? So that is always the answer for that question. All right, um, if you have a book, turn to chapter two. I will just explain, I, I'll probably read one slide on it. There's a simple concept here. Right? It kind of is related to chapter one, which is why I want to finish it. Right? So if we turn into chapter two, what you would see is the same thing. You're going to see a management system again. So I just want to finish off this. You'd see establishing a process of the management system. And we already know the management system is the plan, do, check, act cycle, right? So reasons for integrating a comprehensive process of the management system. So it allows for the organization of the management and process safety risk in a systematic and chronological method of working that is driven by continued improvement. What are they talking about? They're talking about this. This. Right? Chronological. You set up your policy. You do what you have to do. Continual improvement, right? So that's just a part of this is a little bit of chapter one so we could try to finish it, right? Um, demonstrates legal compliance. Yes, we spoke about that. Demonstrates senior management commitment, foster an environment of positive PSM culture, right? If you look at your book, take a look at it. Um, do you have this on page 25? You should be seeing um, like the ISO 45001 diagram there. Or is it OSAS 18001? Anyway, okay, it really doesn't matter which one it is. Yeah, exactly, 45,000 one, right? Okay, so it doesn't really matter which one it is because what they ask is this, you just saw it, right? They ask the PDCA cycle, right? So you see strong leadership, right? So they ask this, so this is the one, if you missed that class, right? I think I put it on the WhatsApp group already on a recording. You have to learn this chart. That's what you could have done the past but just now when they said, where does management review for? Look at here, Re reviewing performance. So you have to learn this. I told you, not everything you have to learn, but if there's something to learn, I would tell you to learn it. So you don't have to learn ISO 45001 because what they bring is PDC. They bring this one. They, and there was an explanation for that. I don't know if you remember the, the um, explanation. If not, I'll say it very fast, all right? The explanation is that 
PDCA is England management system. 45,001 is like the world, right? So because this course comes from the UK, they would most likely test PDC, as you see from the passive questions. So I, I, I didn't have to prove that to you, so it for yourself. You're probably not going to get too much of 45,001 questions, but the elements are kind of the same, right? But in terms of past papers, you, you know, we have more PDC questions than ISO questions because ISO is not really unique to England and it's, it's for the whole world. So like somebody in Guyana, Guyana Showbase could be certified to ISO. Trinidad, you know, SMG Lille company could be certified to ISO, but ISO is not really too popular in England. What's, what's more popular is PDC. So if they're giving you a question, they'll give you a question on PDC because this is where Nibosh is now. Nibosh is located in Leicestershire, which is just the next place after Manchester. It's kind of up, so that's a key point in up, right? It's kind of up on the map. You look at the map, it's going up. The higher you go, you get to Nottingham and, and, and Scotland and stuff. Well, Scotland is to the end of there, right? But to the end of there, right? But the course come from the UK, so because PDCA is their management system, you, you mostly will get a PDCA question. So we did this question before. We did this question in chapter one. So if I could add one new thing to it, in the seven minutes I have, the one new thing I want to add to it is on page 27. Right? So a company that gets certified would have a license to operate, like a store license or an ISO certificate. That goes a very long way for them. That gives them increased access to contracts. It demonstrates management commitment and whatever have you, right? So if you get your ISO certificate, good for you. If Trinidad and Tobago, we have something called store. If you get your store certificate, good for you, right? And in the UK, if you get your PDCA, Certificate also good for you, right? So the one new thing I want to add here, if you look at page 27, you can check and see this page 27 in your book too. It's something called MAP, M-A-P-P, MAP. You could just tell me if it's also your page 27 as well. It, it may be different because I have a kind of older book. Yes, it is. Exactly, yeah, right? yeah. Okay, good, good. Well, I mean, like when we order books, we give you all the new books, but my book here about since 2017, is the original Twitter book, right? So sometimes the edition of the prints over and the pages is the same thing, the pages, but it's fallen on a different page. Anyway, I'm explaining, right? So if you look back at the PDCA chart here, what it required, it required that the company have to come up with a policy for health and safety. So you all know that a lot of companies have a policy, right? They would say, safety is my first priority. Atlantic LNG would say, we will do the job safe or not do it at all. All of those are good things, right? All of those are good things, right? But this is not normal safety. This is process safety. So there is a law in the UK. If you're page 27, the name of the law, you'll find it here. The Control of Major Accident Hazard Regulation 2015. They require the process companies to come up with a unique policy statement then for process safety. And that policy is called a MAP policy. What does MAP stand for? MAP stands for a major accident prevention policy. So this is not rocket science. All you have to do now, right, for those, and you know the normal safety statements, safety is my first priority, you know, um, safety 24-7, whatever your company is, right, safety is everybody's business. But if you're a process company in the UK, and again, this is like a standard to benchmark against, a company have to come up with like a tagline, or you could incorporate it into your normal policy, but it must address process safety stuff then, which is major accidents, right? And two key features of a MAP policy, if you look at down here, so two key features of a MAP policy, it must deal specifically with major accident hazards, and it must include a commitment to protect the environment. And we could stop here today. I just had to repeat that a couple of times, right? So if you are Atlantic LNG and you're coming up to the NIBOR standard, right? Yeah, 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 you may have your policy already which says we do the job safely or not at all. But for like if you're getting certification or you want to come up just in like to the process safety industry standard, they're gonna have to come up with another one to say, like, we are Atlantic LNG, we are committed to preventing major accident hazards and we would ensure you know the care and protection of the environment and if you put those two things in it it becomes what is called a major accident 
prevention policy, right? So you say that you are going to commit yourself to preventing any major accident hazards, and then you are protecting the environment. That is a major accident prevention policy, right? So the map should contain a commitment to provide and maintain a management system which addresses the following issues. And all of these things will fall within your policy. Because once you commit yourself to it, you have to organize it, you know, get people to implement it, right? All of these things are part of the management system for, um, well, if you decide to create one then for process safety anyway, right? Regulation five and schedule two of coma, specify the information that should go into the map policy, the policy or statement of intent, setting out your aims and objectives, your principles to prevent the major accident from happening, right? So I kind of give you one. You can just say, we at Atlantic Energy are committed to preventing major accidents and identifying and preventing catastrophes from happening, right? We are also committed to protecting the environment and ensuring, you know, like zero environmental spills. And that will work, right? So all of this is kind of telling you what it should have said, the statement of intent, the description, but I just did one. So you could, could probably use that one anyway, right? We'll stop it here. Okay, if you turn the page, this one is done. All you'll see there now, if you turn the page, we'll pick it up here next week. It's something that you all also are familiar with. Uh, leading and lagging indicators, but leading and lagging process safety indicators is a little bit different from a normal leading and lagging indicators, right? If you don't know what leading and lagging is, it's like good and bad, right? Uh, page 29, but we'll pick it up here next week. Uh, is a little bit different with process safety because remember you cannot wait for an accident like normal safety then you can say okay um, well a slip somebody slip and fall but then that's a that's a lagging indicator but you can't wait for that in process safety so then what makes up a lagging indicator in process safety the answer is anything that have the potential to cause these things is trying to prevent here a major accident right so if a valve is defective even before the accident, the defective valve is a lagging indicator. If a sensor isn't working properly, the gauge kind of going up and down, it um, fluctuating between two numbers, that's a lagging indicator and process safety. You can't wait for the gauge to completely get over with now, right? And let's say that's a flow gauge, and then if you didn't get it properly, then the tank would overflow, the vessel would overflow, right? A temperature gauge would probably just have a bit of a defect Maybe it's have a bit of a, a play with it or a, a bit of a fluctuation again. All of those things are the lagging indicators in process safety. We cannot wait for a disaster to say fire explosion, right? Because by that time I said it would have multiple casualties and property damages, right? Let's stop there for today. Um, I don't know what we did there in chapter two, have any past papers because we now started chapter two. I don't think so, however, I have seen map policy, right? So I don't know if it, it, this is your book, those who have the book. And if you don't have the book, this is still your slide. What you could probably do is um, take a note of that. Um, like, you know, like, but they give the words, remember that's the fun thing about multiple choice. It's like, um, what's the name of the policy or a policy that is meant to protect from, um major hazards and the environment is called what but then they give you because it's multiple choice so one of them would say major accident prevention policy right so that's why multiple choice is not hard it's not a lot of cramming it's a nice sunday course i mentioned to you all that shouldn't stress you out that that much anyway right so that question did come i think it came in the last exam too right but again i can't see how these things would be um had right uh if if you're doing study right um so what i'll do to i think um you all are kind of better off with the video on the whatsapp group i'll try to um when it's when it's finished converting in fact let me stop it now so then that will kind of happen there by itself right when it's finished converting